Dear colleagues, it's a great pleasure for me to announce this webinar today of the European Association of Cardiovascular Imaging on Absolute Quantification of Myocardial Perfusion. I'm Professor Jörg Schwitter from the Lausanne University Hospital here in Switzerland, and I'm happy to join this, uh, this session with Sven Plein, Professor Sven Plein from the Leeds University in the UK, and with Dr. Amadeo Hiribiri, the St. Thomas Hospital also in London, UK. Uh, so this uh, webinar has the aim to introduce uh, the different techniques and uh, how, to, how to do quantification of myocardial perfusion based ma mainly on clinical case presentations. And this session is very interactive and so we strongly encourage you to add your comments and send in questions, etc. Uh, for the learning experience, yes, we also invite you to answer multiple choice questions we'll, we, which will pop up during the presentations. And at the end of the two talks, we will have, again, time to, um, to address questions and uh, specific questions after each of these two talks. Now, I would like to start with a small introduction into the field. Um, and uh, here we see the role that is uh, perfusion assessment in coronary artery disease. And I would just remind you that we have quite good data on the detection of coronary artery disease by cardiac MR here. Uh, you know these large multi-center trials, multi-vendor, MR impact, C-mark, single vendor, very big one. Others like Goddard, Cut, one and two just published um, uh, last year. They present a very good performance for diagnostic uh, performance here for detection of coronary artery disease, better than scintigraphy here. And this was repeated exactly by God, God, uh, a large international trial. And I want to remind you that also with visual analysis, uh, already we have very good performance here with prognostication of the CCs. You see here that normal CMR goes with an event rate, annual event rate of less than 0.9% per year for cardiac death, non-fatal MI in almost 10,000 patients here, a registry, so daily clinical practice with visual reading is not that bad. But however, I think quantitative assessment may offer more precise and probably less observer-dependent analysis, which would be an advantage. I also want to remind you, if we go for quantification, there is a lot of uh, discussion, of course, on coronary flow reserve. And we have to, I want to remind you that coronary flow reserve depends here, of course, on the maximum flow here that goes with increasing pressure in driving pressure in the coronary arteries. The more driving pressure, the more flow you have. So it depends on the maximum vasodilatory capacity of the capillaries or the arterioles recruitment of arterial, of, arch, of capillaries, and also with the aortic pressure. And here you see also the coronary flow reserve, the difference here of the ratio between baseline flow and, and hyperemic flow. This depends on many other factors. So here you see this plateau during increasing, this increasing pressure, there is no much increase of flow because you have this range of autoregulation here, but Still, you can shift this, this level of autoregulation of baseline flow, for example, by resting metabolism. A simple hypothyroidism will increase the baseline flow and reduce coronary flow reserve. Of course, if you have high contractility, sympathetic drive, you will have increased baseline flow and reduced coronary flow reserve, which has nothing to do with the dilatory capacity of the capillaries. It's just increasing baseline flow by higher contractility, higher flow by anemia, hypertrophy, all these other factors here, interstitial fibrosis, afterload play into that. Systolic wall stress, of course, if you have high systolic wall stress, a large ventricle, this large uh, systolic stress, you have a higher baseline and smaller coronary flow reserve. Also heart rate, of course, if you have higher heart rates, you have higher baseline flow and decrease in coronary flow reserve. So I think uh, you should have in mind these, these interactions. It's, it's quite a complicated uh, situation if you have just a coronary flow reserve to interpret that. Uh, and in this, in this situation, I think I, would remind, I want to remind you, it is important that you want to decide on revascularization. If you want to decide on revascularization, I think you should assess regional ischemia because you want to know is there a stenotic area in a, in a particular epicardial artery? Or is it more to assess prognosis? If you want to assess prognosis, probably you can go for global ischemia, global coronary flow reserve. The measurements are more reliable if they are global, but then you go for more 
assessment of prognosis. And here, this, the, the treatment would probably be a systematic treatment, for example, uh, improvement, uh, intensification of risk factor management. So it's important whether you want to use uh, perfusion CMR or another, another test of perfusion to guide revascularization or to guide risk factor management. Uh, yeah, I have to uh, say that I get, uh, I'm happy to get a research grant from BioHealthCare Switzerland since many years. That's my disclosures. And now I would like to uh, give over uh, to the next uh, speaker, to Sven Klein, to present the first, the first talk. Yeah, thank you very much, Jürgen. That was a good introduction uh, to the, the topic of today's webinar. So I was going to start straight in with a case. Um, and the first case here that I'm showing is of a patient who um, is sort of a typical patient presenting to a chest pain clinic, uh, middle-aged, multiple risk factors, uh, and stable exertional chest pain. Now, I have to say that in the UK, the national uh, guidance for this type of patient would recommend uh, CT and geography, uh, but our clinicians are at liberty to choose the investigative procedure that they consider to be appropriate. I don't know why in this case the referring physician chose it, but he's, uh, or she sent the patient for a stress perfusion cardiac alarm scan. Uh, we used a typical protocol that includes stress perfusion, uh, uh, CINI assessment of LV function, rest perfusion, leg alignment enhancement. In our practice, that takes around 40 minutes. Um, if we're pushed for time, then we leave the rest perfusion out and we can do it in sort of half an hour. Uh, that's sort of a typical uh, protocol these days. And for a stressor, we use typically adenosine intravenously infused. Uh, it can also be done with regadenosine. So I'm going to show you the key images of the study. Obviously, there are many, many more images acquired in a patient like this. Uh, but uh, for the first multiple choice question, I'm just showing you stress perfusion at the top, the three slices from the base to the apex, rest perfusion, and then late galilinum enhancement. I appreciate not everybody in the audience will have prior experience with perfusion MR, but it'd be a nice test of your sort of knowledge uh, for yourself. And I guess for us to see what you thought uh, without any further information uh, was the diagnosis in this patient. So we've got a minute to answer this question. And I think the time has already started. Uh, so perhaps just to comment a little bit on the choice of modality here in my hospital, we have uh, the fortunate position of having all the modalities available um, that are sort of commonplace, echo, stress echo, um, nuclear perfusion, MRI uh, and CT. We don't have uh, cardiac PET um, and we leave it to the clinicians to choose uh, the test that they think is most appropriate and things that are considered typically are um, the age of the patient, the gender of the patient. So younger females would often go for stress echo uh, unless the images are expected to be uh, not very good, in which case they come for MRI. Uh, complex patients with previous revascularization history in the often come for cardiac MR uh, and sort of more elderly patients uh, would often go um, to expect. So we have the results, I think, of, of the uh, yep. survey. Jörg, what, what is the outcome? Yeah, it's a... Uh... It's a good outcome. Uh, most of the people, they are quite okay uh, with some experience in the field, I would say. So there is almost no wrong answers. And most of the people, they answered three vessel, three vessel disease. And um, the second place is prior RSA infarction. And I think these are the two questions, the two answers which are correct. Maybe uh, Sven, you comment on that? Yes, okay, so good. So I thought the best answer was three vessel disease. Um, and that's because I think there's ischemia in the stress perfusion images here in the LAD territory. I've only highlighted the midventricular slice, but you see the same in the apical slice just here. There's no scar in this territory. I think this is true induced with ischemia in the LAD. There's also a perfusion defect at stress in the inferior wall here at the uh, infraceptal wall, inferior septal at the mid and the apical inferior wall without significant scar. And there's some induced with ischemia in the lateral wall uh, certainly at the mid-ventricular level. So I think three vessel disease is the most correct answer here. So coming uh, on to the right Corian infarction, I think that's kind of correct. If you looked at these images, you may have said there was an infarct here, just a slim white line endocardially uh, indicating a subendocardial infarct, but it's a little bit too lateral for me for this to be a right coronary artery lesion. So I would consider that to be circumflex territory. Yes. But perhaps those who've answered right coronary infarction have seen me present this case before, um, or they just 
have visionary abilities and they have seen that there is indeed an infarct in the right coronary artery territory as well, which is much better seen when we use what's called dark blood late gallinin enhancement. Uh, and we don't have time to explain that in detail today, but as you can see, the blood pool here on this image is bright. On this image, using a spe special MRI technique, we've made it dark. That makes it much easier to see these slim uh, scars in the endocardial border. Uh, so indeed, there is a small infarct in the right coronary artery territory. So for the 23% uh, who said that, uh, that's certainly uh, a correct uh, and well, very well done um, finding. LAD ischemia, of course, is also true because there was LAD ischemia. Microvascular disease may be coexisting, but with the visual interpretation, and that, I guess is part of the learning point from this case, looking visually at this, I don't think we can comment on the presence of microvascular disease in the presence of this significant epicardial coronary disease uh, that we've demonstrated with the regional perfusion unit. Uh, Jürgen also mentioned this, uh, the performance of visual perfusion imaging, whichever modality you look at is already very good. So here's a, a meta-analysis from uh, a few years ago uh, showing for MR, PET, CT, spectrum echo, all of them perform very well in the 80 to 90 um, uh, area under the curve, uh, so equivalent to sort of high 80s or 90s of sensitivity and specificity. But we have to remember, of course, these are studies that were done in high volume expert centers. The read was done by highly trained experts and specialists. Uh, and we do know from uh, studies uh, such as this one from Amadeo's group um, that the performance of readers, um, certainly for cardiac MR perfusion, uh, improves with experience. This is a study uh, of uh, 50 patients where level one readers, level two and level three readers, um, so increasing knowledge and expertise in MR, uh, were given the same data to look at. And the diagnostic performance, as you can see, for those with level one knowledge was only around 50%, whereas the level three readers uh, were reaching the performance that we uh, saw in the uh, previous rock curves. So it looks like visual interpretation of perfusion images is difficult uh, and does require experience. Uh, so this leads on to quantitative perfusion, the topic of today's webinar, uh, and just uh, very briefly to give you an introduction to how quantitation, quantitation is done. Amadeo will go into much more detail in his presentation. In order to quantify, we need a dynamic data normally, uh, so we acquire images over a period of time. Uh, we look at the signal as it uh, evolves in the left ventricular blood pool or the aorta, which gives us the input function, tells us how much blood goes into the myocardium. And in green, we look at the myocardial tissue response, obviously a little bit later than the left ventricular blood pool and a little bit less high, only about 20% of blood go into the myocardium. And then using all sorts of different forms of modeling here shown is uh, Fermi deconvolution, which is commonly used in, in MRI. Uh, we can then derive absolute measurements of myocardial blood flow. Uh, and just for terminology for the rest of these, <laughs> this webinar, uh, we use terms like myocardial blood flow, Cori blood flow, myocardial coronary blood flow reserve, which for the purpose of today's webinar, I think you should all assume to be uh, synonymous. There are multiple me methods that can uh, perform this type of quantitative analysis. Probably the most commonly used are PET and increasingly cardiac MR. Uh, CT also is very suitable to quantitative analysis. Uh, the high spatial resolution is a particular bonus. Uh, ECHO, uh, perhaps out of the four, the least suited uh, for true quantification but there are some semi-quantitative methods that are also available in, uh, in echocardiography. So we're coming back to the case from earlier on, uh, and these are the quantitative perfusion maps now for the patients uh, and the perfusion studies I've shown you uh, a couple of minutes ago. So these are automatic, automatically um, acquired inline um, perfusion maps, which pop up on the scanner a couple of minutes after the scan is done. Uh, so everything's done by an automated software uh, that was developed by Peter Kelman from the NIH that we have on our scanner. So we get these images routinely now on our clinical uh, cases. And um, as you can see um, on the stress perfusion map, you've got blue areas and a few red areas and um, everything should be red at stress. So if you have an adequate response to, uh, to the uh, vasodilatation, then perfusion should increase and that's coded in a red color whereas the colder blue colors are reduced perfusion relative uh, to the, uh, um, the better perfused areas. You can see that the perfusion is much the same at stress here as it is at rest in most territories. And indeed, it seems a little bit lower here, even in the inferior 
um, septum and midventricular and even in the anterior wall where, where the color is even darker than at rest. So this is significant free vessel ischemia uh, uh, consistent with the visual impression that we had from uh, the MCQ I showed you earlier. So um, a quick um, MCQ now, just 30 seconds for you to give me your opinion. And this is just for me to know what you think about all of this. Do you find it easier to look at the map or do you find it easier to look at the uh, uh, original dynamic series? So we've got four answer possibilities and you've got a few seconds left to answer this question. I think the, the questions they started, maybe you could mention in principle, we would analyze, yeah, there are 20 seconds remaining to answer. In the meantime, I think you would assess the perfusion images in a standstill situation. You would not run, as I personally, I would not run uh, the perfusion data in, in, in a cycle and looking at that 30 times, but uh, I would just uh, stick to one uh, peak image and, and assign uh, ischemia to that image. And uh, this yep. uh, makes the, yeah, like in this situation, it yep. makes the evaluation a little bit, a little bit easier. I agree. So with we that. have the yeah, we have yeah. the results, uh, sixty one to A, and the re the rest is between ten and seventeen percent. So easier to read A would be, what is A? It's easier to read the visual analysis. So the the quantitative view methods are easier to read. So that's sort of the, the fishing fishing answer yeah. I was hoping for. So this is what this <laughs> yeah. is all about. Uh, I was ready, however, for the possibility that people would have a different opinion because I think this is a very easy case. Uh, but not every case is as easy. And if we look at these uh, dynamic images here, uh, I find them quite hard to read. You see there's a little bit more grainy and then there's some sort of perfusion defects. Top is stress, by the way, bottom is rest. And okay, let's do what you had suggested and uh, pause the um, pause the, the acquisition somewhere at peak exercise. It's still quite hard uh, to um, I find to um, yeah, it's difficult to pause it at the right moment. But anyway, yeah. clinical practice would pause it at peak perfusion uh, and try to read what this means. So a little bit easier to look at this map, uh, which shows us there's good overall perfusion reserve. Uh, so there's a lot of orange and red here, but there is the subendocardial ring form perfusion defects uh, at midventricular slice and in the basal slice, not so much at the apex, um, suggesting in this case, this may well be a microvascular disease, but we're coming to that in the subsequent slides. So why quantitative perfusion imaging? Some of this has already been mentioned by Jörg. There's certainly the hope and expectation that's less observer dependent and easier to look at and therefore more objective. It may provide similar performance for people who are not experts in, in reading these studies, uh, whereas a perfusion imaging visually read, certainly for cardiac MR, can be quite difficult. Um, there may be some benefits in people with balanced or multivessel disease. Uh, and we already mentioned microvascular disease. Um, there is prognostic information I'm going to show you uh, a few examples of in the next few slides. And if you do research, it's quite useful to have a number to attach to a, to a perfusion assessment, uh, perfusion reserve of 1.3 before treatment and 1.5 after. That's not something you get in the same way from a, a visual read. There are challenges, uh, not always available to have these quantitative tools. And of course, uh, like any technique, uh, it's not as easy to do as it seems. And Amadeo will go into some of the uh, sort of modeling of, of perfusion in order to derive quantification. It has its own challenges and, and tricks and, uh, and pitfalls and downfalls, et cetera. So it doesn't always work. And you need to know what you're doing in order to understand the numbers that you get out. Uh, so that's, but uh, how does this perform compared with uh, expert visual reads? So here we have an example from the CMARC study. Um, Jörg already mentioned CMARC 2. CMARC 1 was a single center study of 750 patients who had um, nuclear and MR perfusion and angiography. We looked at a subset of 128 of those, performed quantitative analysis, and it was reassuring to see that the quantitative analysis was just as good as the consensus read of two expert readers. Whether you use the stress myocardial blood flow or the myocardial perfusion reserve, meaning stress over rest, um, it performed just as well as John Greenwood and I reading these studies. Um, and um, that is a small sample, but uh, perhaps representative of what we would sort of expect. I don't think anybody expects for um, quantitative analysis to be necessarily more accurate uh, than 
uh, visual reads, um, but the pet literature um, is a little bit different here. So uh, I'll show you an example from the literature from a recent uh, position paper in the Journal of Nuclear Cardiology, where it's a little bit small, but you can see there's a perfusion defect in the anterior wall, which is a bit bigger at stress than rest. But if you look at the flow reserve, it's only 1.12 uh, overall, so there's almost no flow reserve, um, and this patient turned out to have three vessel disease. So in, in, in PET, um, perhaps the problems are slightly different, and there are quite a lot of studies that have looked at visual versus quantitative perfusion analysis, and they're very um, they're not very consistent. So some studies have shown similar performance. Uh, other studies have shown better performance for quantitative analysis. This is the study that I'm showing out of the five or six that I found um, because it's got the largest population uh, and I think is, uh, is, is the best conducted and most comprehensive study. So this looked at 130 patients <clears throat> and it looked at a range of um, quantitative and visual uh, interpretations of the data. So there was stress myocardial blood flow, there's the flow reserve, there's the relative flow reserve, which is basically taking uh, within a patient the best and the worst perfused uh, segments. Uh, and there's a relative to perfusion defect, which is a visual analysis. If you look at the graph on the right, you can see that the sensitivity for all of those analyses was not very impressive in this study, but we'll come back to this in a second, but that the quantitative measures outperformed um, in orange, the visual interpretation um, with the relative PD being the visual assessment uh, significantly also shown in the rock. So this particular study suggested that adding quantitative information to visual read improves uh, diagnostic performance. So sensitivity in the study was not brilliant um, at 50%. Specificity was very good. Uh, and this points to something uh, that we all have to remember when we uh, use quantification. Uh, because in order to say well, what's normal and what isn't normal, we apply a threshold. And of course, wherever we put the threshold determines whether we have high sensitivity or high specificity. In this case, sensitivity and specificity for the detection of epicardial coronary disease. So you have a threshold at a relatively high flow reserve. You're going to have a very sensitive assessment because anybody who's got an abnormality in, in, in the myocardial blood flow reserve will show up as abnormal, but you're going to catch uh, a lot of false positives. The specificity isn't going to be brilliant. So the key is, if you want a balanced assessment to be somewhere in the middle, uh, and the study we were looking at before probably have a threshold uh, quite low for the flow reserve, and therefore uh, they have a very good specificity, but not so good sensitivity. So this is a challenge for quantitative analysis, but also an opportunity because you can decide uh, what it is you want to pick up. Do you want to pick out everybody with coronary disease? Do you only want to pick up those who definitely have um, microvascular uh, pathology? Uh, and you can do that by switching or varying the threshold that you use for myocardial blood flow reserve. Staying on the theme of PETs, so what is the benefit of using quantification? On the left, again, a visual interpretations of, of PET perfusion in three patients. And this is from Lance Gould, it's a few years ago, but I really like this uh, image because it really drives home the message. Visually, there's a perfusion defect in the right coronary territory that looks quite similar in all three patients. So these are all relative uh, comparisons of perfusion in different territories. And if you look at the, uh, the coronary flow reserve, uh, you can see that patient one has a good flow reserve apart from this territory in the RCA. Patient two has almost no coronary flow reserve anywhere. Uh, so he has, um, uh, he or she will have significant either three vessel disease or underlying additional microvascular disease and patient three is somewhere in the middle. So this clearly differentiates something about uh, these three otherwise similar looking patients. And you have touched on this. What is it we want to know? Do we want to find out is there coronary disease? And you probably have picked that up with all three of them. But there's clearly additional information in this versus that. And that's the other beauty of, of uh, uh, or the, the benefit of quantification. Because there is um, diagnostic, there is, in addition to diagnostic uh, value, there is prognostic value. You see that here, uh, nearly 3,000 patients rest stress PET, and you can see that those with the best flow reserve down here have the lowest cardiac mortality, and those with the lowest um, coronary flow reserve have signific significantly higher cardiac mortality. So you get additional information out of the same acquisition that allows you to reclassify risk and patients here, those at intermediate risk before using the quantitative data 
a third of them could be reclassified as being higher risk than was presumed before quantification was added. Um, similar things are um, possible with Carnegie MR. Uh, this is a study from this year from James Moon's group, uh, where it was shown that an MPR uh, by Carnegie MR of less than 2.4 um, was associated with a lower event-free survival uh, than uh, an, an MPR of uh, greater than 2.4. And uh, the last slide is this work from Amadeo again, uh, who has done a similar analysis in 400 patients where they measured ischemic burden either visually or with uh, myocardial flow reserve. And they found that also the quantitative analysis um, of MPR had better prognostic uh, implication than the visual. So I'll just summarize uh, for my part of the webinar, um, quantitative perfusion imaging, uh, I think, um, there is enough evidence to show that it has, in most circumstances, at least similar performance to visual read to detect coronary disease, epicardial coronary disease, that is. Uh, there is a bit of dichotomy in the, in the literature around whether it uh, is perhaps even better or whether it's only better when you have, uh, when you compare to inexperienced readers. There are benefits in terms of three vessel disease and microvascular disease, and there's definitely additional prognostic value over the visual read. We have methods with PET MR CT and to some extent with ECHO, and um, uh, the analysis, although not available everywhere, is certainly becoming more widely available and easier to integrate into clinical workflows. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sven, for this excellent talk. Uh, giving a, a good balance between different techniques and uh, advantages of quantification. I think we, we have now time to have some questions, one or two questions, which are directly related to your talk. And then we can go uh, for the second talk and answer questions again uh, after the, the two talks. I just look what we get. Uh, okay, here we have questions. Maybe I, this means if things are so. The example, maybe uh, I address this question to you, Sven. Here is uh, somebody who asked you from Italy. I think he says the example of PET perfusion, three cases, was published in 2009. Does it mean that the technique is not so useful in, and easy in the daily clinical practice? Uh, as I said, I like this case because it's, uh, uh, it's, a, it's a good illustration of, I think, the key, key point. PET, quantitative PET analysis has been around for much longer than for MR. Uh, the, the three experts you have on this call are all um, uh, more MRI experts than PET, um, although I know that we've all done a little bit of PET. Um, so there is, uh, the, I, I wouldn't say that um, the reason this is an old example means that it's not useful in clinical practice. Um, quantitative PET is much more integrated into uh, diagnostic workflows already than it is for Carnic MR. Um, and uh, I think some of the data I showed later on um, are, are much more recent and demonstrate that there is a role in clinical practice for quantitative PET as well as emerging for quantitative MR. Yeah, thank you, uh, Sven. I was a little bit absorbed by so many questions that came in. Uh, and uh, yeah, I, I should just uh, take a few of them. It's, it's of course a subjective uh, decision which, which question to take, but uh, maybe just because you had a very nice CMARC uh, trial, which can go into this question, uh, Sven, here is somebody uh, from UK. Uh, should a raised CT calcium score in a patient with chest pain be investigated with invasive corneangiography? From England, Hull. Dr. Eddy, uh, I think which test to use? There are nice criteria to use, and there was this CMARC trial which challenged the nice criteria by other arms that tested CMR in these arms to avoid unnecessary angiographies. Maybe you, you can comment on that. Yeah, the, the specific questions about uh, calcium scoring, I think that's a webinar in its own right. Uh, we could uh, spend an hour talking about whether calcium score should be investigated. Um, the CMARC 2 trial that you mentioned uh, was an outcome trial that uh, looked at the avoidance of unnecessary angiography using different investigative strategies, including uh, CT angiography, so not calcium scoring. Uh, and it showed that um, different pathways have similar, uh, lead to similar event rates. So it showed equivalence basically between the UK standard practice uh, as described by NICE 
uh, an MRI-based and a, a nuclear-based uh, approach. So um, suggesting that uh, all three arms are uh, equally uh, appropriate when it comes to avoiding unnecessary coronary angiography. Okay, maybe a lot. Maybe this question. Yeah, maybe this question here comes. We can do at the end. Sorry. Uh, when you when would you know to use dark blood LGE? Hmm, that's a maybe. very good question. Again, not directly related to quantitative perfusion, of course, but uh, we'll cover it quickly. Uh, we now acquired it in all patients because uh, um, it, it uh, is useful in some patients. It's difficult to know before you read the images whether it is going to be useful. Uh, so where you have it available and you have the time to do it, I would just add it on. Uh, it doesn't have to be in all the planes that you do the other imaging in, the, the, the bright blood, uh, but we know have seen numerous examples where you pick something up on the dark blood that we haven't seen on the, on the bright blood images. Uh, there's been a question here about the number of slices acquired in perfusion MR. Uh, that's a quick one to answer. Three slices is the standard. It covers all the 16 segments uh, that we need to look at according to the HA uh, classification but it is possible to acquire more slices. Uh, there are numerous techniques uh, that allow us to accelerate the data acquisition so we can squeeze more slices into the acquisition. Uh, clinical practice, I would say, in the, the vast majority of centers is three slices because it is sufficient um, to make a diagnosis. And, um, uh, but, but yeah, there are ongoing research efforts, including from Amadeo uh, and including from us in the past, we've looked at 3D perfusion um, we haven't found a clinically uh, in daily practice superior, uh, partly because of the technical challenges of going faster. But I have no doubt that um, technical advance uh, over the next two years will mean that we will routinely be able to acquire more slices to provide more coverage of the heart. Whether we use that to acquire a couple of long axis slices along with the three short axis ones, or whether it's better to have six or even nine short axis slices, uh, I think that remains to be determined. Okay, yes, yes, I would agree. There is still ongoing research in that field and I think uh, with accelerated techniques, there will be more possibilities. Um, yeah, I think uh, there are se several other questions that can come at the end because they cover the whole field of quantitative perfusion analysis. So I think we can uh, take these questions at the end of, uh, of the session and give the, the opportunity to, uh, to Amadeo Kiribiri from uh, from King's College in London to present uh, these subjects. So thank you very much, Jürgen, for the introduction. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. So um, Zwen has shown us how uh, quantitative analysis is now becoming a viable alternative to visual assessment, despite the fact that visual assessment in the right hands uh, is still very accurate. Um, and uh, we have already seen some of the evidence in the literature uh, which support the prognostic value of quantification, uh, the high diagnostic accuracy, and also now with the advent of automated analysis, um, you know, the technical advan uh, you know, uh, advancements which allow us to perform a completely automated analysis, which makes it relatively easy to obtain and therefore potentially available everywhere. Uh, I think a reasonable uh, question to ask, since we've also discussed about PETs, uh, is to see how the two techniques compare. And that is, uh, if we consider PET our reference standard for the assessment of quantitative perfusion in patients in a clinical setting, how does the uh, MRI quantification compare in, uh, in, this, uh, in terms of results? Uh, this is my disclosures. And uh, these are some maps which um, sent to me by Andrew Ryan from the NIH. So uh, back to MRI versus PET. So um, I'm going to show you two studies in my presentation which try to address the same uh, question. Uh, one is an old study from our group back uh, in 2012 uh, using Fermi uh, deconvolution as a quantitative method. And later there will be another study using tracer kinetic modeling of uh, MRI data for quantification. And you see that back in 2012, using Fermi deconvolution, uh, we could demonstrate a relatively good agreement between the uh, Marcada perfusion reserve measured by CMR and the NPR measured by PET. We had a coefficient of correlation of 0.75, which is indeed very good. Uh, however, at that stage, uh, we didn't have a very good correlation between the absolute values obtained with uh, the two methods. Uh, we had a correlation of 37% uh, for uh, stress perfusion MR and about 30% for the uh, resting 
uh, blood flow. Um, and uh, at the time, we, uh, you know, we justified these results, which were clearly suboptimal, uh, with the difference uh, in the methods which were used for quantifying uh, MR data and PET data. Um, and, uh, and there was agreement at the time that micro perfusion reserve was going to be more reproducible across different scanners and different centers, and therefore was the uh, principal index to be used. Um, I think what we had at the time was a bit the same problem which uh, people had, uh, you know, only 100 years ago. If you look at this cabinet for foreign weights, which can be found at the Science Museum in London, you, will ha you have lots of different drawers and you have uh, standard weights which define the weight in every single city around the world. So effectively, what they were doing at that time, they were calling uh, with the same name different quantities. And that's a bit what we were doing with MR and PET uh, about 10 years ago. On one side, we had a very well-defined uh, PET quantification method. You know that for PET, we have different tracers and uh, the behavior, particularly the extraction of the tracer during first pass is very well known for uh, different uh, tracers. Uh, and uh, we can use uh, either a single tissue compartment model if we want to quantify water or rubidium, or we can move to a, a two compartment model if we want to quantify ammonia. But all these methods are very well defined, uh, have been around for many years, and they are accepted and reproducible. Uh, and that's what makes PET our current reference standard. On the other side, uh, MRI. MRI uh, keeps evolving. Um, I will present a few slides about uh, very recent developments in the quantification algorithms. Uh, but you see the story of quantification started about 120 years ago with indicator dilution theory uh, published in, in 1897 and then has evolved uh, through the application of the indicator dilution theory to first pass injections of tracer and then uh, uh, Fermi modeling was proposed to calculate NPR by Michael Yeroshero and Norbert Wilkie uh, and then the evolution of the uh, methods led us to tracer kinetic modeling then automatic quantification and then eventually inline automatic quantification as the example Sven has shown. Very recently um, we, we have seen new quantification methods and new fitting methods becoming available we have seen uh, the first applications of artificial intelligence to the quantification, and we have seen an effort towards standardization. Uh, I would like to start discussing destandardization as a first point. Uh, you will agree with me that it's very difficult to move the same patient across different scanners, particularly if you want to repeat PET uh, acquisitions, and uh, so we will have to administer some radioactivity or to have the same patient in the same physiological conditions being scanned on different scanners on different days. So uh, if you want to standardize the measurements and study the systematic error which the uh, technique, the scanner, the software, and the post-processing are introducing in the measurements, you will need a phantom. So a, uh, a synthetic system which simulates perfusion uh, as close as possible to the real physiology and allows you to test the acquisition methods and validate the quantification. That's exactly what we have achieved uh, using the so-called perfusion phantom, a system which I've initially developed as part of my PhD uh, quite a few years ago, and then more recently has been redeveloped into uh, a working prototype uh, digital system uh, as part of an European-funded uh, consortium led by Tobias Schefter from PTB Berlin. Uh, and with this system, we can uh, inject contrast agents uh, with the same uh, methods used for patients. We have a realistic cardiac output, we have realistic perfusion rates uh, through uh, some filters which simulate the myocardial tissue. And very recently, we have developed uh, two compartment models, like the one shown uh, at the bottom of this uh, slide, uh, where the contrast agent, uh, which flows into the filter, uh, runs very quickly inside the capillaries, which represent the vascular compartment, but also diffuses outside the capillaries to constitute the uh, extravascular compartment. And we can uh, regulate these two compartments independently, and therefore we can uh, generate experiments where we uh, acquire the MRI images and or the PET images at the same time, and therefore start st starting to study the uh, systematic differences between imaging modalities. Uh, we have recently uh, presented an application of this phantom. 
uh, in this paper on the European Journal of Hybrid Imaging. Um, on the left of the figure, you have uh, some images which are peak uh, activity uh, in the PET images in, in the orange, uh, peak announcement on the MR images, and then a fused image at the bottom. I also had a movie, effectively the phantom allows you to measure the input function through the synthetic aorta. Uh, and then uh, you have a signal uh, across the so-called myocardial compartments. Uh, and, uh, and what you see here is the effect of a combined injection in the first pass of both the uh, PET tracer and the MR contrast agent. The MR contrast agent is in gray and the PET signal is in orange. Effectively, what the phantom allows us to do is to study the same phenomenon in a reproducible fashion uh, with two different imaging modalities. We could perform a CT scan as well uh, and learn from the differences in the perfusion estimates that we measure with technique A versus technique B, what are the systematic errors which one technique has compared with the other. And that's uh, interesting because it does inform the analysis of both the PET data and the MR data and uh, allows us to improve both. Uh, another relevant development um, in the quantification is the introduction of uh, tracer kinetic modeling uh, for the quantification of myocardial blood flow. Sven has already mentioned Fermi deconvolution. Uh, that's a very popular method uh, and has been refined over the years, uh, particularly through the work of the uh, NIH group led by Andrew Rai, um, and uh, particularly when it comes to the normalization of the uh, transfer function. Uh, the other alternative to firm is tracer kinetic modeling, where uh, you uh, input in the algorithms some uh, uh, assumptions on the physiology of the microcirculation and the exchange of the contrast agent from the best cell to the interstitium. So you can relate the input function to the myocardial tissue curve. And as we have recently demonstrated, uh, you can also uh, use a tracer kinetic model in combination with the Bayesian framework that is a probabilistic approach to the solution of the mathematical equations uh, for quantification, which allows the generation of these uh, very high resolution uh, quantitative maps. Here, every voxel is around one millimeter in, in plane resolution. Uh, and uh, where normal perfusion is in the orange to yellow range and perfusion abnormalities are in the purple uh, to black uh, uh, range of colors. And you see that uh, these maps, uh, you know, they are more robust than the less square fitting which uh, has been used in the past years. Um, Sven has already mentioned automated uh, quantification. Uh, I think automation is the key uh, for success for uh, automation for quantification. Um, the operator can introduce a significant bias in the analysis. Uh, and uh, Sven has shown us how sensitive our decisions are to the, um, to the threshold of the fusion values which we decide to use. Uh, if, we, if we use a completely automated quantification pipeline, uh, then uh, uh, all this variability will be taken out of the equation. Uh, what you can do, you can divide the uh, process in different steps detection of peak announcements, detection of the cardiac region, segmentation, rotation, and then quantification, and come up with the maps automatically. And this can be done in line on the scanner. Um, if you want to speed up the uh, process, uh, you cannot use uh, artificial intelligence. So you can train a network or different networks to be more precise to solve the same steps uh, with the advantage of making the whole process more adaptable. So it will uh, work also with outliers and will be easier to adapt to every patient, but also much faster. Uh, as you probably know, one of the uh, main advantages of AI is the speed uh, gain, which uh, this allows. Uh, you can also imagine to uh, substitute the trace kinetic modeling with quantification directly. And in fact, uh, you can imagine to uh, train a network, in this case made of convolutional layers and fully connected layers, uh, to predict uh, what the uh, perfusion uh, values would be starting from the same input information, so the arterial input function and myocardial tissue curves, is the full uh, tracer kinetic model. So you have here an example of a map calculated with AI, that's the predicted model at stress and rest. And on the other side, you have the uh, fully quantified uh, maps obtained with the tracer kinetic model. As you see, there's a slightly uh, more spatial filtering in the AI predicted uh, maps uh, compared with a full model. Uh, but the results are very, very similar. 
the difference, the main difference is that the uh, full trace kinetic model requires about 30 minutes per slice with this Bayesian framework. Uh, the AI model requires 30 seconds per slice. So effectively it makes possible to obtain these curves in real time during a clinical scan. So um, what, what was the result of all these innovations on the accuracy and comparability of uh, CMR perfusion versus specs? Uh, this is the second paper. Uh, from 2017 uh, from Eric Englund. Um, and you see that our R, for, uh, the uh, coefficient of correlation, has increased for the absolute values from 0 0.32 to 0 0.92. So we had uh, a great uh, increase in the accuracy and comparability between the two methods, which effectively uh, makes MRI one, you know, like the alternative to PET whenever PET is deemed too expensive or is not available um, for quantification. Now, uh, I think we have a couple of minutes left. So I would like to show you something where I think MRI is uh, slightly easier to use uh, than, uh, than, than PET. So, uh, and uh, I just want to make the case for the combined assessment of perfusion and late enhancement. Uh, in a single scan, uh, which is really something which is feasible in under one hour of scanning with an R. And uh, with PET, uh, it's probably also feasible, but would actually requires slightly more complex dual injection of different traces or assumptions on the rest uh, perfusion values of SCAR. So you see this paper published back in 2003, uh, which demonstrated that uh, microvascular disease, uh, defined at the time as a severe microvascular disease in patients with hypertrophic adenopathy, had uh, independent prognostic value for these patients. Uh, in that case, um, severe microvascular disease was defined as uh, perfusion reserve uh, less than one. And, um, and I think this is the paper based on which, uh, you know, uh, has been cited hundreds of times. Uh, we, uh, we think that microvascular disease is effectively a prognostic, uh, of prognostic value in hypertrophic adenopathy. However, uh, few years later, we have shown that uh, also SCAR itself can generate perfusion abnormalities in these kind of patients. Uh, this is a study we published in 2014 on clinical radiology, where areas of uh, confluent late enhancement as frequently seen in patients with hypertrophic adenopathy resulted in a similar pattern of perfusion abnormalities. So uh, we hypothesized that perhaps not all the so-called perfusion uh, uh, abnormalities or microvascular disease seen in hypertrophic adenopathy was effectively due to inducible perfusion abnormality, but was rather a mixture of microvascular damage and functional impairment. Uh, and we ran a study on this topic uh, and for which we had to develop a combined uh, assessment of late enhancement and perfusion. Uh, effectively, we created a highly adaptable template, uh, which is represented in yellow which uh, can be used for the segmentation of both late enhancement and perfusion images. Um, and that generates uh, maps of late enhancement and perfusion in the same uh, uh, two-dimensional space. And what we can do with this data, we can fuse them together to generate a combined map which shows you late enhancement in gray and perfusion abnormalities in red. And uh, we can use this tool to uh, perform the to to improve the diagnosis of uh, ischemia, calling inducible ischemia or microvascular disease on the areas which are viable and show reduced perfusion, and uh, characterizing areas of scar as such. So uh, basically, we will uh, reduce the uh, systematic error induced by scar in the determination of the ischemic burden. And where we tested it in a population of patients with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, uh, we found that the uh, so-called severe microvascular ischemia reported by the previous studies in this population, that was um, areas of myocardial perfusion reserve of less than one, uh, which is represented in this blue curve, that's the ischemic burden before subtraction of late enhancement, was effectively disappearing if we were subtracting late enhancement from the so-called ischemic burden, and that's the yellow curve. Uh, making these patients look very similar to patients without any late gallery enhancement at all. So that's just a way to uh, remind you that uh, microvascular disease is a spectrum of different types of disease. 
going from just a functional uh, impairment of the microcirculation uh, to a proper disruption of the microcirculation characterized by scar and capillary rarefaction. And uh, what MR allows us to do is to generate quantitative maps of both these phenomena with the same spatial resolution in the order of one by one millimeter in plane, uh, and then generate a combined assessment, uh, which is probably able to give us more detail, uh, as we can see, microvascular disease and late enhancement as separate phenomena. Now, these experiments were performed in patients with hypertrophic adamopathy. We expect the same post-processing to be of value in patients with, uh, with ischemic heart disease. Uh, I'm moving now to the last part of my talk. Uh, I also have a couple of cases. Um, so um, I would like to uh, show you three cases specifically and see uh, if just based on the analysis of the maps, so I'm not going to show you any movies, but just the still quantitative map, you are going to uh, be able to identify the right diagnosis. So let's start with the first case. So uh, pay attention to the color scale. So in this case, we have uh, high perfusion values uh, between orange and white going through the yellow, uh, impaired perfusion values uh, from uh, or dark orange all the way through purple, blue, and black. So in this first case, based on the map, would you expect this case to be a normal perfusion? This is a stress perfusion map. Or would you expect it to indicate ischemia in the LAD territory or RCA territory or circumflex territory? Or uh, do you think this represents a patient with balanced ischemia and three vessel disease? Just judge on the dis distribution of the different levels of color across the image. Very good, Amadeo. I think we have the question, the answers here. We are a little bit close at this time, so we should uh, spend not too much on the on the on on this part. But uh, I think we we have normal forty percent, and the rest is ischemia somewhere. And I think the right answer is normal because there are very high normal flow ranges uh, for stress perfusion. Um, this is a very high level of, of value, so that would be normal, right? Yes, absolutely. So I think what we see here is the normal variability of the perfusion values across the, uh, the cavity, uh, across the wall. And um, yes, and the values are all very high. So these are absolute values. So this was a case with normal perfusion. But let me show you another case with a little bit of ischemia. So uh, this is a patient with a hypertrophic ventricle. You see it captured in systole, so you see it's very, very thick. Uh, the values are beat on, on the orange side everywhere, and in the subendocardial layers, they tend to purple color. Uh, and I think they are relatively similar across the different uh, perfusion territories. So uh, would you call this normal, or would you call it uh, CAD in any of the three perfusion territories, or would you think that this is rather diffusely reduced perfusion, uh, more severe in the subendocardium, perhaps indicative of microvascular disease? There are 15 seconds to go, and then we have still five minutes for the rest of the, of the webinar, so uh, we are a little bit uh, at the end of the time, but um, that's okay. I think we have in one second the results and we get, oh, let's see. Ah, there is the last one we see is 87% diffuser reduced perfusion, microvascular disease. Um, probably very likely. I think for you, that's the right question, the right answer. I could play the Advocatus Diaboli and would say this could also be a, a, a an LED perfusion problem is a little bit of circumflex. I think we should probably not over over interpret the data, but we can say here if there is no 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 scar, there is a generalized ischemia in the subendocardium and this this distribution probably more likely microvascular than epicardial, but not a hundred percent sure. Are you agree? Yes, absolutely. And I think <laughs> okay. the, uh, in the presence of. Uh, you know, like of minor lesions in the coronaries, we should not lead to implanting any stents or proposing the patients any revascularization. 
you know, actually yeah. be relatively reassuring and it's for medical therapy. Okay, Maybe last question. Huh? A final map. So uh, that's uh, more dramatic. You have uh, very orange values. So in the normal range in some of the myocardium and very purple uh, tending to blue in other areas. So uh, based on this map, would you expect it to be normal? Maybe not. Would you expect the patient to have ischemia in the LAD, RCA, circumflex territory? Would you expect any scar in the RCA territory? So uh, I'd like you to focus on the uh, difference in color, certainly. So going from a very bright yellow to the purple in the lateral wall, but also comparing the lateral wall with the inferior wall. Um, you see that the variability of the perfusion values is completely different. The dispersion of the values is completely different. It's more consistent in the inferior wall and less in the lateral wall. Let's see the results. Okay. So we get 38% uh, are voting for circumflex ischemia, 38% vote for RCA scar, and the rest is a little bit everywhere. But I think um, they got it, right? Absolutely. So uh, <laughs> this patient definitely had uh, circumflex ischemia. And uh, if we had beta announcement, there would also be a very nice transneural scar in the RCA. So my summary, therefore, is that the advances in the field of quantitative perfusion nowadays allow an accurate quantification of myocardial blood flow values also in comparison with our reference standard, which remains spec. Um, I think the key is robust automatic quantification, which will also benefit from AI allowing us to use more complex models, but in a reasonable amount of time for the post-processing. Uh, and I really think there is another value in the combined assessment of LGE and PEC, which is only possible, uh, sorry, LGE and perfusion, which is possible with MR and more difficult with PET. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Amadeo. Thank you for this uh, very interesting uh, and, and excellent talk. I think I will add a few things to... Um, to go for the conclusions, I think it should work. Okay, yeah, my conclusions from, from your talks, which were very clear. I think we, we can first state that combined perfusion quantification and LG analysis is a very useful approach, uh, which is not typically done with PET. So usually you inject the flow tracer and, the vi and not simultaneously a viability tracer. So high resolution viability data from LGE is really adding a lot to better understand the perfusion situation. Uh, it is important, certainly quantification of perfusion CMR, it can be important for coronary disease, but also for cardiomyopathies and for microvascular disease. Here, I think we have to learn quite a bit how to integrate the data, but the tool could be very interesting to, get, to understand better the pathophysiology of these different microvascular disease mixed with epicardial coronary artery disease. Then the other point, which is very interesting, I think um, this quantification with uh, these automatic analysis is less obs observer dependent, or maybe in the future, no observer needed anymore. Opens a lot of questions, I would say. Artificial intelligence may help in data analysis. I agree. I think they we have to see the computers uh, as, as our friends, uh, more than as enemies. And I think it's, it's, it would be a big advantage in clinical studies to have numbers on the results and not uh, subjective assessments. Um, then the, the last point, CMR quantification versus uh, PET. I think there, there, there should be a caveat on, on this topic here and to always have in mind where you, whether you measure global perfusion versus regional because global is much more robust in the result because the, the sampling is, is much larger than in a small areas of segments for regional perfusion. And for the prognostic information, what do we measure? Are we measuring something to guide revascularization or are we measuring something to guide risk factor management? And how should we correct the coronary flow reserve for all these factors that go into baseline uh, resting flow values? I, I add here just one, uh, slide, uh, maybe 
Candelis, you can move to the next slide because it does not really. Ah, yeah, this one, just to remind you, I think it's it's very good to be very optimistic on new techniques, but uh, we have very good and strong data on uh, visual reading. So we have something to lose if we go immediately or too very fast to uh, techniques that would replace that. And you 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 know this, this data from uh, Amadea who showed the correlation with PET. If you have this plant Altman plot here for the regional uh, assessment, regional comparison, the coefficient of variation is roughly 25% here. You say typically uh, to replace one method with another, it should be 10% or less. So there is some uh, room for improvement here because the co coefficient of variation is not that strong for regional. It's much better for global, but for regional, it's difficult. There is another study in Czech 2018, a recent study. If you look at the baseline flow here, 1.37 plus minus. If if you go for the 95 confidence interval, it's something between 0.6 and 2.1, which was, would translate in this in this situation. If you have this range of, of resting flow in at the same hyperemic flow of three, for example, you would get any corneal flow reserve between 0.7 and 5. Uh, and this is for global. So I think uh, uh, we, we, we have to be happy with what we have. Uh, I think it's a very interesting time where we live with is this artificial intelligence where we can look into kinetics and into quantification. And there are some caveats, some work to, still to do. I think it's great that Amadeo is working on, on a phantom to get more, more clear uh, objective data on what what uh, technique is, is doing what. And now I think we should go to some questions. We have uh, one or two minutes still to go and uh, maybe you, I find uh, yeah, got, questions. If, if I may, I've, I've, I've quick fire answers to a few questions that people have asked. The first is um, about the requirements for pulse sequences for quantification in MR. Yes, it's true. We, we've sort of didn't comment on that uh, in, in the presentations. Ideally, you'd have what's called a dual sequence acquisition, which gives you different sensitivity to the contrast in the input function as opposed to the myocardium. Uh, it's difficult to explain that in, uh, in more detail in a few words, but uh, these techniques are now available on most vendors, uh, and where they're not available yet, they will become available. An alternative is to use two boluses of injection, a small bolus for the input function and a larger bolus for the myocardium. That's a little bit difficult to do in clinical practice, and most people move away from that. And the uh, commercially available uh, and the research um, post-processing tools now can deal with both of those, dual bolus or dual sequence. But I suspect in a few years, though, at the latest, there'll be dual sequence acquisitions on all vendors' platforms. Yeah, very good. Maybe I, I would add one question which burns a little bit, uh, uh, which is one question from Spain. Uh, why do you bother with quantitative analysis and so on if we have the ischemia trial, which mitigates Quite dramatically the use of revascularization and I thought a lot about about that and my interpretation is that first in the ischemia trial no MR was used so we don't know what would be the role of MR in ischemia management. The second point is and there, there is there is sub analysis that show that the, the extent of ischemia is important for the outcome and I think this was not exactly explored in that ischemia trial, which amount of, of, of ischemia is, is, is beneficial for revascularization, and which amount is too small um, to be revascularized uh, without any benefit for the patient. I think the amount, the burden is very important. Quantification could help here with CMR, for example. What is your opinion, Amadeo and, and Sven? Yes, well, well, that's a very good uh, question, I think. Uh, I, th I don't think we should forget about uh, microvascular disease on one side, uh, which can give you the same symptoms as uh, coronary artery disease, but clearly doesn't offer a target for revascularization. We know that these patients with microvascular disease have, uh, at five years, 55% uh, prevalence of uh, repeat uh, angiographies. So, you know, like uh, if we had a positive scan for a microvascular type of pattern, we should probably uh, let these pe uh, patients on medical therapy and not uh, sending them to the cath lab again and again. 
And on the other side, uh, identifying, I mean, there's no doubt also from the ischemia trial data that uh, revascularization offers a very good relief for symptoms, uh, but clearly you should focus on treating the vessel which is responsible for ischemia. And again, that's where we can help uh, really dictating out of uh, say three lesions in three major vessels, which one gives the most severe burden and should be treated first. If I, for my response, may refer you to a paper in Cardiovascular Imaging 2020, uh, which is the multi-society viewpoint on the ischemia trial, uh, where the Society for Cardiovascular Magnetic Resonance has given a position uh, which is far more detailed than I could give it in, in, a, in a couple of seconds here. But so have a look at that paper. It's called Cardiac Imaging in the Post-Ischemia Trial Era, a Multi-Society Viewpoint. Uh, SCMR and many other societies have given their view on the ischemia trial. Very good, very good, uh, Sven, to have uh, this uh, this idea to uh, motivate people to read, to learn, and with these uh, statements, I think we are at the end of the webinar. I would like to thank also to the sponsor of this webinar, which is Circle Cardiovascular Imaging, for this educational grant, and of course I would thank Sven Klein and Amadeo Hiribiri for their excellent presentations, for the uh, interesting discussion. And I would like to tell you that you can watch this webinar on demand on the ESC website. Thank you very much for your participation.